Hello, I'm Mark from Excel Off The Grid. Now, ever since the mid 1990s, we've been able to create pivot tables. And ever since then, we've been asking the same question. How can we extract information from that pivot table using a formula or a function? Because as great as pivot tables are for quick analysis, they're not great for presentation. So in this video, I want to show you three ways that we can extract information from a pivot table. Firstly, using cell references. Secondly, using the get pivot data function. And thirdly, using cube functions. Now we won't be going in depth into any of these methods. Instead, it's intended as an introduction to give you a flavor of what we can achieve. So why don't you download the example file and then you'll be able to work along with this video. And there's links in the descriptions box below. So once you've done that, if you're ready, let's get started. So here we are in Excel, and this is the data set that we will be using for all of the examples in this video. Column A contains a person's name, column B contains a country, and column C contains a value. From this, I'm going to create a standard pivot table. Now, please note that when we come to using Q functions, we need to create the pivot table with an extra step. But I'll take you through this when we get to that section. For now, I just want to create a standard pivot table. I'll select a cell inside my table, then click insert from the ribbon, then from the pivot table drop down, I'll create my pivot table from a table slash range. My table is called table one and I'm happy for this to be created on a new worksheet. So I'll just click OK. From the pivot table fields, I'm going to drag my value into the value section the name into the row section, and the country into the column section. Next, to make sure that my columns remain the same width when I refresh the data, I'm just going to change a setting inside my pivot table. So I'll right click inside the table, go down to pivot table options, and uncheck the auto fit column widths on update option, and then click OK. Now I'm just going to resize the width of each of the columns on my pivot table. Perfect. So having created my pivot table, let's look at the first option as to how we can extract data from a pivot table. Pivot tables exist on Excel's grid, with each cell in the grid having its own cell reference. Therefore, the simplest method of getting values from a pivot table is sometimes just to use standard cell references within a formula. So over here in cell I5, I could just type equals and then click on cell C5. When I press return, this returns the value of 64. Okay, now let's see what happens if we change our source data. For this scenario, let's assume that Christian isn't in Brazil, but is actually in Finland. So I'll update my data here. Finland and Finland. I can then go to data, refresh all, and come back to my pivot table you'll see that the cell reference to cell C5 has been maintained, but now it's pointing to an empty cell. The value of Carolyn in England is now in cell B5 rather than cell C5. So the main lesson from this is if we use cell linking with a pivot table, that cell references do not change when the position of the underlying data changes. Now it's true that we could have used a formula like index match match, to perform a two dimensional lookup to ensure that we extracted the data for Carolyn in England. However, using a formula on a pivot table kind of defeats the benefit of using a pivot table. To avoid this issue, we can use one of the other extraction methods, either get pivot data or cube functions. So let's move on to look at the first of those, which is the get pivot data function. When most of us think about needing to extract cell values from a pivot table, then get pivot data is probably the function that we think of. And we can set Excel to automatically create the get pivot data function for us. But before we do that, let's just change our data back to the way it was so we get a fair comparison. So we now have Christian back in Brazil, and I'll refresh my pivot table. 
Okay, so let's look at how we can toggle the get pivot data function. So if we have a cell selected inside our pivot table, we can go to pivot table analyze, and then in the options drop down, we have this item that's called generate get pivot data. If that is checked, it means that Excel will calculate the get pivot data function for us automatically. So let me select that. And as you can see, that option is now checked. Right, I'll drag Brazil back to the start, which is as it was when we first created this table. In cell I5 again, I type equals and click on cell C5. You'll notice that it no longer says equals C5, but instead Excel creates the get pivot data function for us. So let's just have a brief look at this function. So it starts with equals get pivot data. The first argument is value. And this is the name of the field that we are calculating on. So the value field. Next, it references cell A3. That is the first cell at the top left of our pivot table. The following fields then come in pairs. So the first item is the pivot field. So name is the pivot field. And from that pivot field, we want the name of Carolyn. The second pivot field is country. And from that field, we want the value England. Our press return, that calculates to 64. Now let's go back to our data. Change Christian back to Finland. I'll then come to my pivot table, select it, data, refresh all. You'll see we have the same movement as we had before, where England moved from column C into column B. So even though the value has changed, with the get pivot data function, it has still maintained that same calculation. And that's because with a get pivot data function, we're not linking to a cell. Instead, we're linking to the sum of the value for Carolyn in England. Therefore, the result of that is maintained even when the value moves location. Now we can become a bit more dynamic with this by using cell references. So for example, here in cell I7, if I type England, and in cell I8, I'll type Carolyn. Then rather than the text values within my get pivot data, I can use a cell value. So Carolyn will change for cell I8 and England will change for cell I7. When I press return, it still calculates that value correctly. Now that also means that I can change these cell values. So I can look at USA for Ethan and that returns the value of 53. So we can start to get quite dynamic with how we extract values from a pivot table. So that's how we can use the get pivot data function. But there's another method, and this method involves using cube functions. Now a pivot table can display information that is stored in either the pivot cache or the data model. At creation, the pivot cache is used by default. But by clicking a single tick box, we can use the data model instead of the pivot cache. Now the data model is a more efficient way of handling data. Therefore, in my opinion, we should always try and use the data model where we can. And the cube functions that we'll be looking at shortly are a group of functions that can extract data from the data model. So since pivot tables and cube functions can both extract data from a data model, then we can use cube functions as a way or an equivalent way of extracting values from a pivot table. Now there are seven cube functions, but for this video, we're only going to be looking at two of them cube member and cube value. So let's start by going back to our source data. Let's put Christian back into Brazil. Then with a cell selected inside my table, I'll click insert. From the pivot table drop down, I'm going to select from table slash range. The only change we're going to make is the tick box that says add this to the data model. I'll select that and then click OK. I'm now going to create this pivot table in the same way as before. So value will go into the value section, name will go into the rows, and country will go into the columns. 
Now Excel gives us a way of converting this entire pivot table into formulas. So with a cell selected in my pivot table, I'll come up to Pivot Table Analyze, then down to OLAP Tools, and then select Convert to Formulas. Boom, look at that, it's just converted my entire pivot table into formulas. If we had placed a field inside the filter section of our pivot table, we would have had an additional dialog box that comes up to ask us if we want to convert the filters or not. If that happens for you, select whichever option you want and then just click convert. So looking at this, you might ask, where's the pivot table? And the answer is, there isn't a pivot table. Because instead of having a pivot table that's connected to our data model, instead we have formulas that are connected to our data model. Okay, so let's go and change our data once again. So Christian will be in Finland. I'll come to my formulas, go to data, refresh all. You'll see it now says hash getting data, and that is now calculated through. You'll see that the columns that previously displayed Brazil now show hash NA, because Brazil doesn't exist within our source table. Also, Finland has not been added into our table. So if we look at the row for Christian, we can see the total is 34, yet we can't see the breakdown that makes up that total. So if we use Q functions, we need to think about how we display that information and making sure that our totals add up to the right value. This transformation process uses two different functions. The first is the cube member function, and the second is the cube value function. So let's have a quick look at each of these in turn. So the first function we'll look at is cube member, and let's look at that in cell C4. So it starts off with the word equals cube member, which is the name of the function. Then the first argument, this workbook data model, refers to the name of the data model being used. And when we use this type of methodology, the value will always be this workbook data model. The next argument is an MDX statement. So it's saying from table one, which is the name of our data in the country column, extract the value of England. And we get a very similar syntax if we look in cell A5. So this time we have cube member from this workbook data model from table one, where the name is equal to Carolyn. And each of these row and column headers have their different relevant values. Now the cube member function in cell A3 is slightly different. So rather than it referring to a field and a value, it refers to measures because it's referring to a calculation. So it will always be measures. And that's in the first set of square brackets, then a dot, and then the second set of square brackets is the name of the calculation that we will be using. So we can use sum of value because it was an item that we created inside our pivot table, which means that it's an implicit measure that exists within the data model. If we change this to max of value, so the maximum value that we have, that won't calculate correctly unless we've previously used the max of value inside a pivot table to create that same implicit measure. Okay, so we've looked at cube member functions. Now let's have a look at the cube value function. So if we look at this, it starts with equal cube value. Then the first argument is this workbook data model again, so the place where the value is being extracted from, and it will always be this workbook data model when using this methodology. It then references cell A3, A5, and C4. So these items are the intersection that we're using to extract the information from the data model. So the cube value is saying from this workbook data model, we want the sum of value where the country is England and where the name is Carolyn. And this works because cell A3, A5 and C4 are cube member functions. Now, if we want to, we can again be more dynamic. So let me come to the cube member function. I'll extract this section of text here and I'll copy that to so table one country England. That's been referenced in cell C4 in this formula, so I'll replace it there using table one country England. And that calculation will still work. 
Now, because this is just text, it means that we can therefore concatenate these values. So let me get the value for Carolyn. I'll copy that, place that inside my cube value function as well. Finally, I'll get my sum of value, copy that, also place that inside the same function. So now this function is completely independent from the rest of the values around it. So I'll extract that. I can even delete all of those cells and it still extracts 64 from our data model. And as I said, we can make this more dynamic. So England, Carolyn, and we can simply concatenate this text. So if the name equals Carolyn and the country equals the country equals England, it will then extract that value from the data model. Now, if that changes to USA and Ethan, it will again extract that value from the data model, which is the same value we would have had within our pivot table. So which is the best option to use? Well, like most things in Excel, it depends. The best option is relative to your scenario. Now for me, since the data model is more efficient at handling data than the pivot cache, that would always be my preferred method. Plus this data model is also the same data model that we use in Power Pivot, which means that if we are using Power Pivot, we can use these same cube functions. So this was just an introduction into the topic of how we can extract information from a pivot table. Hopefully you enjoyed it and learned something new, but don't let your journey finish there. In the descriptions box below, there's loads of links so you can learn more about cube functions and the get pivot data function. Now, if you did like this video, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. Also, if you want to learn how to automate Excel and put your work onto autopilot, then check out excelofthegrid.com forward slash academy for my training program. Well, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.